What was it like to be Bill Land? Wonderful friends, stellar events, imperfect recall over the years. I put a positive spin on this story, but it's from my point of view. It's really a record of events. Because of the contagious virus, we couldn't visit back and forth and reminded me of my father's story about the Spanish flu of 1918. My father as a young child was crowded into a small bedroom with other children and citronella candles fumed the air as adult relatives expired on makeshift beds set out throughout the house. It does feel strange that an epidemic could take hold in our country slightly over 100 years ago. I was born in Methodist Hospital in the heart of downtown Indianapolis at 1010 at night, Thursday night. I was told my birth was very difficult, so difficult my doctor decided to quit his practice after decades. My mom, Libby, was not supposed to be able to have children after she lost my brother in New York City over Christmas Eve many years ago. The first years of our land family were spent living along Keystone Avenue in Northeast Indy, small white bungalow. We moved to 739 Nottingham Court, Sherwood Village, a subdivision of Meridian Hills. Sherwood Village subdivision was located across College Avenue, north of 71st Street. My parents' home location was between Lily's Apple Orchard on the west and the forested Marat Park along Williams Creek to the east. Our home was on a cul-de-sac of Nottingham Court. It was built by the architect and designed mostly for himself in this beautiful subdivision. Our home had several unique aspects. Built as a red brick style home, it had a full basement with steel beams for support. Well appointed fireplaces on both the front porch and the living room, and a full bathroom with decorative tile walls. I remember the home on Nottingham Court as a happy place, a vegetable garden, worked by hand tools by my father, snow fence, compost full of fishing worms and a screened-in front porch, a place to play. At five years old, I had my second encounter with life and death. I had pneumonia for over five months. I remember looking at a little black and white four-inch screen TV my parents had rented, watching The Lone Ranger and Cuckoo Fran and Ollie. The rest of the day, all there was was just a test pattern. My father, Taylor, was an executive at the Coca-Cola Bottling Company in Indianapolis. Dad worked eight hours a day for six days. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. My parents loved dogs. The one family dog I remember best was named Jacques. Jacques' breed was a majestic Llewellyn setter. Several English setter bird dogs followed over the years. When I was about eight years old, Dad and I hunted quail and rabbit. The quail would form a small circle in the fields as the dog worked back and forth. Since the quail were in a circle, they all exploded in different directions. The neighbors within Sherwood Village were all friendly and visited back and forth quite a bit. Over the years, I remember playing with the neighborhood boys bike races, basketball, football, toy soldiers, building forts in the snow. It was very odd to me that girls from the neighborhood never played in the outdoor fun. As I trek through my memories of childhood relations with other relatives, they were pretty rare except for an occasional visit to New York City to visit my mom's parents, Ross and Betty or to head south to Atlanta to visit Grandma Gertrude, my grandfather I had lost to a heart attack when I was very young. My mother's father, Ross C. Treseda, was very wealthy. 
was a member of the exclusive New York Union League Club, and Ross was vice president of Coca-Cola for the whole country. Laurel Laboratories, he was vice president, and also National Distillers that made Seagram whiskey. My mom's parents lived in a huge penthouse apartment close to Central Park in New York City. The same floor lived wealthy movie stars Eva Gabor and Marlena Dietrich. My grandmother, Betty Pace, had been a professor of nursing at Columbia University. My dad's father, Max, was mayor of Cordial, Georgia, as well as the owner of publisher of the Cordial Dispatch, the only local newspaper. Granddad was known as Judge Land and served on the state Supreme Court, as well as serving as a state superintendent of public schools in Georgia. My grandmother, Gertrude Taylor Land, was a leader in several women's organizations. These leadership positions took her to the White House in Washington, D.C., where she met frequently with Eleanor Roosevelt. My father's first name, Taylor, was a maiden name of my grandmother, who was a direct descendant of the 12th U.S. President, Zachary Taylor. My mom had one sister, Jane Lowe, who lived in Europe, several locations, including Madrid, London, and Paris. Bob Lowe was her husband and CEO of Time and Life magazine, wartime magazine Liberty, and good friends of Ernest Hemingway and his wife, Mary. In all my heritage, I felt this was an awesome mix of legal, political, and successful business. I was always inspired by my grandparents' accomplishments. It is true that my father had links to the Old South, and my mom had ties to high-end consumption, both an antithesis of my progressive values. However, I continue to see positive patterns of intellect, ambition, and pride instilled within my genetic memory. For this, I am grateful. My neighborhood was near and dear to me. There are many happy places within my action space, domain, and the place I haunted. My favorite location was Marat Park, about a 10 minute walk behind my home. I use this forest and Williams Creek as a place to embrace and enjoy. I remember well sitting on the woodland floor, just enjoying the company of nature. By this intense interest in biology and zoology, I developed leaf by leaf, flower by flower, and bug by bug, this magnificent forested park and its nature setting. Barat Park was well known for its seven foot diameter sycamore trees. Many of these trees were hollow at the base, making for excellent hiding places in the tree trunk. Our little tiny houses in the magnificent hollow trees only found on the bottom land along Williams Creek. This beautiful tumbling creek seemed to have it all, from round glacial rock shallows with silver shiner minnows, plus crawfish in deep pools, sunfish, and smallmouth bass. Along the creek side, many large trees would rip out of the stream bank and lay across the water. These tree trunks attracted one and all to walk across the barked tightrope circus style. Another aspect of the creek adventure was the hand-sized flat rocks found along the shoreline, which could be sailed across a creek, skipping all the way on top of the bright creek water. Fishing was fun in Williams Creek, especially during the springtime spawn of large buffalo carp swimming upstream from White River two miles away. The sight of schools of large carp were awesome. Dad and I would use treble hooks, dragging them along and hooking the side to these huge fish. As they struggled, it seemed a bit unfair to catch them in such a brutal way. There were deep pools and tangles of tree limbs hung just above the water, dipping close to the rod tip, catching so many little fish right underneath. It was almost like fishing in your own home aquarium. The creek water was deep enough in places for an occasional swim. I remember the day we built a Tom Sawyer style raft. It kept submerging each time we launched. It was called the laughing raft. 